Welcome everyone to today's panel discussion, the power of optimization supply chain strategies hospitals can't afford to ignore in 2023, sponsored by Cardinal Health. I'm Brian Zimmerman, today's moderator, and on behalf of Becker's Healthcare, thank you so much for joining us today. So before we get going here, I'm just gonna quickly walk through some, some housekeeping instructions here. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. Our webinar sponsor will be following up with all questions that we're not able to get to today. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log into today's webinar to access the recording. If at any time you have trouble with the audio or video, try refreshing your browser. You can also submit any technical questions into the Q&A box. We've got folks on the back end who are here to help. So with that, I'm pleased to introduce our, our, our wonderful panelists today. We're joined by Derek Williams, Vice President of Supply Chain Operations with Indiana University Health, and Mike Holland, Vice President of Supply Chain Ohio Health. Thank you, Derek and Mike, for being here. We're going to dive right into the, the first panel discussion, which is really about getting to know our panelists a bit more. Uh, it's an introductory question. So I'm going to tap on each of them to, to tell us a bit about themselves, uh, you know, including their career path in supply chain, as well as perhaps give us an overview of the healthcare supply chain organization they lead. Um, whether, you know, that, that entails the acute, non-acute space. I also want to hear what some challenges you, you're, you're facing, what pressures your organization is facing. Derek, we can begin with you. Well, good morning. I'm Derek Williams. Um, I spent 22 years in the military, so I'm an Army officer by trade. So my logistics experience is built off that. Um, in addition, I spent 10 years in healthcare, so with Baylor, Scott & White, and now IU Health for the last seven years. Uh, my experience in hospital operations from Dr. Stock. Um, my, my backbone that we built in the backbone of supply chain is starting from the bottom and working your way up. Um, here at I, IU Health, you know, I started off as executive director of logistics, had the privilege of building the integrated service center that we have here that supports all 16 acute hospitals. Um, IU Health is the largest employer of the state uh, with 16 acute care locations with over 600 primary specialty offices across the state as well. We also have our own health care plan uh, that we manage. We're about 36,000 employees with about 3,000 beds. Uh, in supply chain as a whole, we have the distribution portion of our business, uh, as well as a cent centralized model that includes strategic sourcing, procurement, uh, value analysis, uh, informatics, logistics, facility operations, fleet services, and equipment planning. So we have the whole gamut of the, of the supply chain within our footprint. Uh, some challenges that we have is, is what everybody had coming out of COVID was analytics. Um, not having the right analytics to dig down into the details to make decisions on that. Um, as well as product disruptions, having you know a lot of product disruptions and how we handle that is always a, a key challenge for us. Uh, not having the right technology or having enough technology in our space was another challenge. Um, trying to maintain and retain talent within a hard um, hiring uh, footprint that we have, you know, it's, it's hard to get, you know, people that want to do our profession. Uh, and while you have all of these challenges, inflation, um, the cost of doing business have increased over the last three years. And so not having that information uh, brings a lot of challenges uh, to us in, in, in healthcare. Thank you, Derek. I, I think your, your your comments about challenges too do a nice job to, of setting the stage of where this conversation is going to go. Um, certainly want uh, to discuss how you how you're addressing some of those challenges specifically. Certainly around you know supply shortages and and some of the broader challenges that you know are are are, are affecting the whole industry uh, in in every capacity. So thank you, Derek, for setting us up there, Mike. Uh, why don't you share a bit about your your background or organization and any uh, any challenges you're 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 experiencing? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, Brian. Good to be here with you, Derek. Uh, humbled to be be with you here talking about it. A lot of similarities um, in terms of my career. Mine was a little atypical for supply chain a leader in healthcare. Uh, actually started in automotive uh, product development, design, application roles, uh, Japanese-based OEM, um, and uh, supplied the uh, auto manufacturers, not only Japanese-based auto manufacturers, but uh, U.S.-based as well. Um, launching product into production led me into to an operations uh, focus um, from that point in my career. I've held 
many roles in, in operations, anything from production, manufacturing, engineering, quality, facilities ownership and supply chain, uh, manager through executive level vice presidents, uh, president roles um, in, like I said, in automotive, uh, non-automotive manufacturing as well, and in healthcare. Really the two primary manufacturers that, that I had worked with um, in the U.S. were Eaton Corporation, Danaher Corporation, uh, Nippon Seiki was the Japanese-based company prior to that. I entered healthcare in 2005, so I've been in the space in various roles for over 15 years, um, held continuous improvement roles, operations roles, and supply chain uh, leader roles in the space. Most of those were business uh, transformation based roles. <clears throat> in terms of our uh, company, Ohio Health uh, is the, the largest regional provider of acute and non acute uh, healthcare in central Ohio. We're one of the largest regional providers in the country like IU Health. Um, we've been on the Forbes Best Places to Work for 15 consecutive years. Um, I believe we were seventh in healthcare in 22. Um, we have 14 acute care hospitals, a broad reaching physician network, uh, numerous, net, uh, numerous F, uh, freestanding EDs in our network, uh, joint ventures, including ASCs, um, our, our primary service area is, is more than half of Ohio's eight, 88 counties. We're about $5 billion in annual revenue, about $1.5 billion in annual spend, and have about 35,000 associates. In terms of supply chain, we're very similar to IU Health and Derek's situation. Uh, we have sourcing, procurement, clinical value analysis, supply chain informatics, logistics, inventory control uh, within our purview, but we do also have sterile processing and we manage the fleet uh, for the entire system as well. Uh, we have about 600 associates within the supply chain function and we do control most of the non-labor contracting and spend uh, other than construction. Um, not unlike Derek and IU Health, we, we have similar challenges um, I, I'm going to say first and foremost, inflation is really tough for us right now. I would say in the material space, labor space, energy, uh, logistics, it, it's all tough. It, it is on its way down, but has been a tough road for us uh, that we're mitigating to the best of our ability. Uh, talent availability and retainment is, is a challenge, um, not just on the nursing front, in clinical roles that you hear so much about, but uh, supply chain professionals is, is a real challenge. Um, our product and service offering complexity continues to be a challenge where you'll hear a little bit later uh, as we dive deeper into that, how we're working on that. But um, th that's been a real challenge for us because we're changing the culture from one of you can have whatever you want to uh, what do we need and how do we minimize variation. I'd say the last item there in our top few is really vendor performance and compliance. We're just simply looking for more from our vendors in terms of partnership, how they deliver every day, the information we're expecting from them. So that continues to be a challenge as well. We'll definitely dive into that component too in terms of how you're working with your, your partners and vendors. Um, I, I, Derek, I want to come back to you for the next question first, though, and, and get to something you brought up, which is, um, you know, ad addressing issues around product availability. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about how you go about mitigating those challenges, um, you know, pushing back against stockouts, managing back orders? What, what solutions does your organization sort of have in place to, to perhaps improve product visibility? And, and can you also sort of make the connection here between how these solutions sort of affect patient safety as well? Absolutely. So first, we wanted to just work with our partners. You know, Cardinal had been our main distributor um, to, to work with them and share more information so we can get, you know, to the product availability down to the manufacturer and even raw material. 
Um, we started to share information so that we can understand um, the resiliency of our partner, which is Cardinal, um, and then how they can support us in the future. Uh, we're also working on how do we automate subs, you know, auto subs within our footprint so that uh, when, when a product goes on back order, it, we automatically can have a sub to replace it. Uh, that's something we've been working on as well. Uh, here at IU Health, product disruptions was, was a big thing for us. So uh, we created our own work group for product disruptions. Uh, that included buyers, our contract agents, our value analysis team members, some operational team members, as well as clinical effectiveness, so that we can get ahead of this and be more proactive in our approach to how we um, we fight, you know, back order management. Um, inside of that, we built our own internal tracking system, you know, starting with the ISC, which is our integrated service center. A distribution center so that we can track the items coming from here and be more proactive in that with the next phase is to, to deal into the vendor uh, direct back orders from requesters. So that is phase two for us, but we want to get ahead of that and be proactive in our communication. Um, also, we want to maximize the use of the ISC. Um, the ISC is support all 16 uh, locations and we're working to increase the amount of items coming from the ISC direct to PARs and to assets. Currently, we're at around about 75% and our goal is to get up to 90 by the end of the year. Um, so the more that we can control, we think we have a better handle of, of protecting our back orders if they come from the Integrated Service Center where we have uh, inventory control managers, demand planning tools, um, and then stocks that we keep up to 120 days worth if necessary of some of our important um, SKUs that we manage here. Um, so, but without it, you know, Part of the main portion about the patient safety is when there's a back order, that means two things. Our clinicians can't take care of patients. Or, you know, if we're going to sub something out, then they have to do clinical um, education on that product. So the more proactive communication that we can give to them, uh, the better response they can have to take care of patients. So we're, we look at this as an important patient safety and, and more of how we can proactively of give changes. We understand that back orders are going to happen. Uh, that's just part of doing business. Uh, but if we can be more proactive in getting that communication out to our clinicians, then they can respond better to it in order to uh, change practices necessary to take care of our patients. Dan, a quick follow-up for you there too. Do you think this um, this real emphasis on proactive communication, do you think that was sort of um, uh, pushed further by, by the pandemic, you just really had to embrace this, this, this proactive approach to communication. Yeah. And then, you know, as uh, my old boss told me, never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, and so, you know, we had a good crisis where, you know, supply chain was brought to the table. We had more visibility um, all the way up to the C-suite. Uh, we had a lot of eyes on us. Our profession came out of the basement to the forefront. Um, and so when you get more visibility, you get more access, you got a seat at the table. And so that communication became very important. Um, and so the more that we can provide them proactively, the better they can make decisions on the back end. Thank you, Derek. Mike, I want to get to you in just a second, but Derek, I got one more, one more for you. Just uh, something that sparked an interest um, in me is, you know, thinking about getting elevated, uh, getting into to, to the seat level and, and talking to folks and, and having a seat at the table. And I imagine too, like, some of the stuff that's happening around inflation is also putting uh, putting elevating your voices as well. How do you think about uh, sort of ma maintaining that foothold in in the leadership room uh, beyond sort of let's hope we get to a more boring uh, place as as a, as a society with uh, maybe inflation calms down, pandemic calms down, we have a a few years of stability that might be nice. How do you keep keep that foothold um, in, in the leadership room? Yeah, part of our five-year plan was being a trusted partner so that we can maintain that seat. Um, and so providing, you know, the, the great information but based off analytics. And I think that's what we didn't do well in the past, uh, not having the analytics so that you can provide the leaders with real timely information so they can make decisions, not just financial decisions, but like I said, clinical decisions. So the proactive communication has got to be based off facts. You know, uh, we're a true believer that facts versus fiction. A lot of the, the noise in supply chain was a lot of fictional things of, uh, of discussions going on. So we are going back to the basics of building the analytical profile um, that we can be able to have, you know, real quantifiable discussions with our leaders so they understand really the supply chain and the benefits of having us. And I, I think over the last two years, 
um, we show that value. And I think we've showed it as an industry across the board. Um, I visit a lot of our peers. I visit Mike at Ohio State. And, and the more that we're doing behind the scenes is now coming for, to fruition um, in our discussions with our leadership. Um, supply chain is a part of our resiliency plan as a healthcare system. So we are uh, a top two risk when, you know, when we're talking about our integrated service center. Uh, we have a building that supplies all 16 hospitals, 75% of what's stored there. Um, so we're showing them the value of what we can bring to the table. And part of that proactive, communica proactive communication, uh, we believe will keep us there. Thank you, Derek. Appreciate that. Mike, let, let's turn back to you now. So thinking about how your organization um, addresses sort of supply chain issues, product availability, that sort of thing. But also, it, you know, as you mentioned in your first answer, your supply chain organization also supports surgery centers. So curious if you could speak to any differences between your, your, your acute and sort of surgery center um, strategy here. Yeah, let me start with the first part, if you don't mind, Brian, with, um, you know, the disruptions. Uh, Derek, we share a lot uh, of, of the basics um, around disruption, just to quantify that. What we were seeing at Ohio Health was a 4,000% increase from pre-COVID. Um, so what we mean by that is, uh, you know, line item gaps is what we were measuring. In pre-COVID, it, it was uh, roughly about 500 that we had to chase down. At our highest point during COVID, it was 4,000% higher. So that's 20,000 versus 500 a month. Um, if you can only imagine the labor associated with that, that was a real struggle for us. I'm not gonna say we're out of the woods, Derek. We're, we're similar to, to you all at IU Health. Um, we were at about 1,000% now, not 4,000%. We made a lot of progress. I'd underscore a lot of the things you pointed out as things we've acted on. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, analytics is a big deal. Us having auto subs, of course, is a really important uh, capability for us. Um, and, uh, you know, the thing I like that you said, Derek, was the back to basics kind of thought process. Um, so there's a couple of things I want to point out there. Um, there, there. There's no substitute for good old process clarity and process improvement, right? And the conditions really forced us into being very assertive about that. So examples might be, or examples are that we've uh, implemented are something we call in, in sourcing the, the quick approval process where wh why should we send every contract through legal um, if, if certain conditions are met that really don't make that agreement that different, why send it through legal? Why don't we just run with it? So we've established a process like that through, through continuous improvement. Another example is, and we're working on pulling the trigger on this right now, is why don't we send one order per week to our, our vendor as opposed to multiple orders a day? It's gonna reduce their labor, it's gonna reduce our effort. So no, no, no substitute for just good old fashioned improvement, including visibility of the work, good KPI dashboards, it improves decision-making. A um, couple other things that are helping our disruption uh, are uh, really a demand planning function we've, we've stood up during the crisis. Uh, we didn't have that capability before. So now we're, we're getting better and better every week, month, and, and at looking at uh, what's our volume of usage and how's that look, you know, two, three, four months from now. And how does that change our buying, our SKUs, et cetera? So, so that's been a good capability that we're continuing to refine. We're broadening our low unit of measure uh, distribution from our distributor. We also use Cardinal and have for a number of years. And then we're also in the process of really changing our distribution model to complete low unit of measure almost everywhere. Um, consolidating our inbound from national brands that might be on pallets through a 3PL partner uh, like, like Cardinal, breaking that down, bringing it low unit of measure. So those are some other things we're doing. Um, what, one thing you mentioned, Brian, and asked about that I just want to spend a little time on, then I'll touch on the, the ASC piece and, and outpatient in general. Um, 
safety for uh, our caregivers in the care environment is really, it, it's a challenge and one that we have to meet well. Um, we have a lot of turnover, uh, staffing gaps in, in the clinical environment. The, the worst thing we can do is have a, a rotating offering of product that they now have to get used to. So that drove innovation um, that we had to think about. Uh, one, one idea that we have in motion right now, and we're, we're in the process of finishing that up is um, a particular label that has a QR code on it that's really bright and obvious for a new product that's landed in a, uh, a nurse uh, supply, nursing supply room. They can just uh, uh, scan that QR code with their phone and watch a video for how to use the new product. Um, that's been really helpful for us because Derek, you were talking about, you know, you got to reach your caregivers somehow and you got to give them advance notice. So we, we had to supplement our daily huddling with our care teams in a way that was more dynamic. So we're going down that path. Um, <clears throat> so to outpatient and ASC, Brian, you would ask about that. Uh, yes, we do have an outpatient and non-acute arm of our supply chain. We've been in that business, I would say, in terms of us owning on behalf of our, our organization in the outpatient space for about three years now. It's going really well. Um, have a have a uh, distributor on the outpatient space. We've integrated our uh, ASCs into all of that, including what our clinics are getting, freestanding EDs, um, health centers that are primarily outpatient based. Um, the thing that uh, is a, a little different in the ASCs is um, the, the progressive nature of the care team in those ASCs wanting to reduce variation, right? Um, so we actually leverage that audience because they also largely practice within our care sites to be more aggressive in variation reduction. So that's, that's a bit unique in terms of how we interact with our ASCs. They are joint venture owned too. Uh, we don't outright own them in most cases. Uh, they're joint ventures, but, but I like that because the physicians having a stake in the game uh, really helps us have productive conversation around offerings and how that translates into the acute care setting. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate the background on on that and sort of the distinctions between um, uh, the the the, the non-acute and, and acute care supply chain. There, your your strategies. I want to get to something both of you have have brought up now, um, which is sort of this proactive communication engagement with with staff, um, giving them the tools they need. I you know I think I, I believe I saw a survey where it was two out of three respondents said they spent up to the fifty percent of the time, fifty uh, percent of their week managing inventory. It's a survey of operating room management and professionals. So, uh, you know, given the workforce crisis that has already come up here and low staffing levels and sort of all the dynamics involved with needing to train new new nurses, get them the information they need when you're substituting, per perhaps. Um, can, can you talk about a little bit more about the solutions you're leveraging to alleviate some of the burden that's on them? Um, Mike, we can begin with you this time and then, and then Derek, we'll, we'll jump to you. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna lump this into uh, three categories. First, hey, let us manage it rather than you managing it. Um, so we've had a couple really interesting examples of that. Contrast Media was one example. Sodium bicarbonate in our dialysis space, another example where our caregivers were just getting overwhelmed because they didn't have what they were ordering, and then when gaps would emerge, they didn't know how to handle that. So good old fashioned, let us take care of it and do our thing rather than you doing it. Um, it the second category, I'd say technology. You, you have to have technology adoption. We cannot continue to do it the same manual way we've always done it for the past 10, 20 years. Um, really, there's a couple uh, couple technology platforms that, that were aggressively pursuing and have already implemented in some cases. First of all, Wavemark is, is a technology that's being offered that, that we very much are double, doubling down on. Um, for example, in our uh, heart and vascular procedural space in our flagship hospital, 
Um, it, we've seen six times return every year. So when we look at you know, how much product could potentially expire, how many recalls are in that space, because that's a very innovative space. Um, you know, just those things alone allow us to really control that through the Wavemark technology, because it's all RFID based. We have complete visibility of that high value product from entry into the building all the way through exactly where it is at the point of use location and then through the charge process. We've taken all the manual aspects of that out. So we, we see about six times return and that's conservative because uh, we're only looking at our uh, year over year ongoing return that excludes our one time inventory pickup that was about 15% reduction. So really powerful technology there that we're leveraging that that almost entirely takes it out of the hands of the caregivers. It's always there when they need it. They know where it is and they can find it if they're if they're new. Um, another technology um, is, uh, I, I would say, Opt Optifraid has been a really important partnership and technology for us. Um, and, and so I'd lump Optifreight under more of the third category, which is the more integrated partnerships we're seeking um, with our vendors. Optifreight is really simply said, almost like a GPO for freight, um, where you have this, this partner that wakes up every day thinking about freight in all aspects and where can we leverage volume through, through existing contracts that we may not have ourselves for parcel, for LTL, um, you know, whatever that might be, inbound, outbound, they constantly look at what we're doing and allow us to make improvements on rate, consolidated routes, uh, so on and so forth. Um, you know, I was looking at the numbers uh, this past year, we saved uh, nearly $4 million uh, through Optifreight, which more than headed off the uh, inflation we were seeing in the logistics aspects of, of many situations. So, so that was great. And um, I would say uh, also in the, the last category of greater partnerships with our vendors, we're moving more to a uh, 3PL model, like I mentioned a little bit earlier. We're looking for uh, to get out of the self-distribution business. We're just not designed that way. We kind of got forced into it during COVID. We're looking to get out of that business. So, um, so really have a 3PL partner that can uh, broaden our low unit of measure everywhere uh, would eliminate big 53 foot tractor trailers showing up at our care sites that are already space constrained. Instead, we have multiple deliveries with totes of pre-picked product. Um, so, so I would say those are the things we're really doing. Lastly, I would say, Brian, you know, our point of use solution for things that are not as high value uh, that we're plugging into the Wavemark technology, we're going to use 2BIN. 2BIN Kanban, but um, uh, facilitated through LogiQuip uh, has a set of hardware and even analytics and technology that allow us to auto order. So those are some of the things we're doing. So when, when our clinical and care team comes to uh, the point of use, what they need is always there without yeah. certainty. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mike. And I, we will we'll dive in, in even further into sort of the, the partnership components here and, and the sort of a, uh, the, the integration of partnership and technology, a lot about technology there, how you're using it, and also just the what you shared up front struck me too, the, the communication and let us handle it. Um, so the so some direct communication there, big technology, uh, useful technology, and then these partnerships too that, that come along with that technology. Derek, can, can, can you build on those comments, uh, share any insights from, from, from your perspective? Yeah, I think Mike hit it on hit the nail on the head. Uh, we're, we're experiencing the same thing. Um, we saw not only saw that our nurses were working on supply chain, managing, managing inventory and supply chain, but 50% of the supplies in our hospitals were not managed at all by supply chain. So that's that's why they're managing it. So some of the tough conversations and critical conversations we're having with nurses is 
is, is let us build trust with you so we can do it for you. Um, and it sometimes it's about showing them that you can manage your own area well so that they have trust in you to change it over to you. Um, so we're having some of those discussions by fixing our internal footprint. Uh, managing, import, managing inventory shouldn't be this hard, but over the last 20 years, um, it has been. Uh, if, you, if you go inside the, the, the four walls of the hospital, uh, the technology and the data is just not there. Uh, our team at, you know, couldn't see when, when PARs were being scanned. Uh, but we built, you know, a Power BI tool now that we can see now when, when a PAR is scanned real time, uh, what items are coming into that PAR. So adding new technology like that gives our facility operational leaders visibility into their inventory so they can make decisions real time and also uh, be able to explain to the nurses their levels of supply chain with data that we didn't have before. So it's, that's another thing that we do. So WaveMark, we're implementing WaveMark too because getting to high dollar spaces is part of that 50% that we don't manage current state. So having WaveMark in the technology and in, in, inside of those high dollar spaces gives supply chain visibility to more supplies to manage. Uh, we're also looking at technology inside our part rooms, you know, uh, point of use, but also like something as simple as ESLs, you know, electronic shelf labels uh, mm -hmm. to, to build on it, the automatic ordering that Mike was uh, talking about. Um, we're about a 90% two bin combine shop now. So we want to improve on that so that we can have the reorder points um, and the processes to build that trust. Um, but I want to add to this point, you know, we talk about the 50% of our, um, the professionals that are managing inventory, I would say 60% of our time in the hospital is chasing inventory that we don't manage. Mm -hmm. um, and so we want to give our team back uh, some time as well, you know, uh, to make sure they're 100% uh, focused on what we are managing versus hunting down items that we're not. Uh, so it's important that we, we, we drill on that too as well. Yeah, what, what's the saying? The squeaky wheel gets the grease. So you don't want to, you don't want to give it too much grease to that, that <laughs> stuff that you're, you're not supposed to be tracking, right? Right. Uh, so I, I want to dive into sort of some of the partnership stuff here, uh, too. There's already been examples that have come up. Um, Wavemark, for example. Uh, can, can you talk more, Derek, perhaps about how you've collaborated with strategic partner to, to hit these operational goals, optimization, optimization goals, thinking really here about the data you've already mentioned, insights, and and something we've we've talked about uh, Wavemark and others, but pre-source hasn't come up. Uh, yeah, but, but anything you can share there around how you're using data and partnerships to, to achieve goals? Yeah, so, you know, we have a fairly new leadership team. And so what we are doing is just assessing our ecosystem, you know, um, our supplier re relations, the data that we can get, um, having, you know, using all the resources that our suppliers and vendors can, can help. We're, we're realizing that we're not maximizing um, the offerings that they currently have. And so we're taking a look at that as well. Um, I'll give one specific one, um, you know, the Opti Freight one that Mike is doing. I think we're doing a good job with Opti Freight. You know, our partnership with them has been um, short of amazing. Um, right now, given our visibility to our vendors on how we ship products, um, working on how do we palletize. You know, I run a, a distribution center out, out here at ISC. So the opportunities of palletizing shipment versus getting one each is off a UPS truck was important to us. Um, also reducing the overnight activities of, you know, the products coming to us overnight when they can come the next day on normal um, shipping like that, you know, benchmarking ourselves against other healthcare systems. Uh, that's, that's where we're at. Currently, we're in the top 5% when it comes to average cost per pack when it comes to um, Opter Freight. So we're, we're leaning in with our partners to help us bring that value back to us. Um, and then how can it help us take us to the next level? Um, so now we're talking about how do we go beyond just small parcel, how we can partner with Opter Freight to, you know, to bring in um, somebody on site to help us manage this who has the skill set um, to, to really learn freight management and run freight management. So that's important to us as we partner with any of our partners is to, is to dig into how we can partner better, uh, how we can share more, um, to look at, you know, like I said, from the supplier all the way to your raw material, your manufacturer, how we can be uh, a partner in that. Cardinal is also helping us, you know, determine some of our pre-subs. Um, that's another good partnership that auto subs that they're helping us with is to uh, it, when we have discussions to come to the table with some ideas of what uh, subs that we can use. So it's important that we have that connection with them as well. 
Um, so as we work with our partners, um, another big one for us was our business continuity plans. Um, and so Cardinal was our partner with that. They are our distributor, our main distributor. So if something was to happen to the ISC, what will we do? How will we do it? Um, how will we issue supplies to every, every part of our hospital? So uh, we had tabletop discussions where we, we mapped it out and, and we processed it through. And so we were able to test our uh, business continuity plans with our partners um, like yourselves and like what Cardinal did for us. So that's what kind of things that we're doing and leveraging the data and insights um, from our main distributor. Thank you, Derek. And Mike, same question to you in terms of uh, diving in more. You've already shared quite a bit about uh, how you're working with, with, with Cardinal, your partners, to, to really drive these insights. And, and thinking here about the, the data-driven elements of it, I think are really important. Um, Octifreight, of course, has come up. Uh, Pre-source pre is another data-driven tool that, that, I, that I believe you guys can use. Mike, can you speak to any of that? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm going to start with just the general statement that if we don't have analytics, we just can't make good decisions in real time. Yeah. And so um, we need that pervasively. And, you know, I'm going to under, underscore a couple of things, Brian, that I already kind of pointed out already. And then just add a, a couple. First of all, just Cardinal in general has really helped us through a very difficult time. Um, we were really struggling. I mentioned the disruption volume uh, to you. It, it was it was tough. Um, we pretty much didn't do anything else there for a while other than scramble around and get product because our gap reports were so so pervasive. And like Derek, we have a new leadership team. Um, I, I've been the executive leader for about 18 months now. Um, and my entire team is, is about that new as well. So there was a lot we had to learn about. Um, it was unprecedented. So we uh, had to think about new ways when we didn't even carry, in some instances, the historical appreciation for where we were pre-COVID, right? So I just wanted to, to make that general statement about analytics and the fact that Cardinal in general really helped us get to just a different place. Um, do a lot of pre-source activity with Cardinal now. We see way upstream. We, we have much more proactive ability to respond to things. Um, and, you know, disruptions continues to go down on our priority list because of that, uh, that activity and partnership. I'm going to underscore a couple other things I already mentioned. Again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say optifrate has been really important for us. Um, Otherwise, we could have gotten crushed pretty bad by uh, logistics uh, inflation. And OptiFreight really helped us think differently about our inbound. Um, we don't really do much outbound unless we're doing uh, movement around the system, which again, we'd prefer to not be in the self-distribution uh, space. So a lot of inbound changes and thought that OptiFreight helped us with. Again, we saved nearly $4 million in the past 12 months. Uh, Wavemark, I wanna underscore again, uh, you know, I'm a huge proponent of Wavemark RFID technology. I mentioned that um, we're, we're now down to in our one, one place um, where we've had it for probably four or five years. Again, our highest value product space, um, heart and vascular procedural space. It accounts for about 5% of our total locations needing the, the technology that we deem of high value, which we're calling initially $100 per unit and above. Um, but they account for about 15% of our total inventory value in that space. So us managing that really well and tightly in real time was really important. The Wavemark technology is fantastic. Um, and we've since learned so much about that, that we're broadening it as our, our standard across the entire system. We're in process of doing that right now with the Wavemark team. So again, anything $100 per unit and above, that's our standard across 14 hospitals, any surgery uh, centers that might qualify with product of that magnitude. Um, and just a little bit more about what we've seen, um, we're down to our expiration of product through Wavemark controlled area being less than uh, 
the industry average is more than three times that. So uh, really helpful. Um, we've had just in the past year alone, a hundred products that we've gone and proactively taking, taken out of the point of use space proactively, either because of expiry or recall. So really important uh, partnership there for us. And we have a number of others, but I'll, I'll pause there, Brian, see if you have any questions. Yeah, yeah, Mike, I, I think that how I want to maybe close out the, this conversation before we get to some audience questions is thinking about, you know, we talked a lot about challenges and I think a lot of the conversation around supply chain more broadly um, it can be have a, a negative slant to it, I uh, suppose. Um, it's always about crisis, maybe even predicting the next crisis, what's around the corner. But I've also been struck by uh, both your answers, sort of like thinking about the resilience and adaptability of your teams and the, and the, the good work you've done. Um, so I want to perhaps finish here on an optimistic note, which is what, what future innovations, what, what things are you working on that uh, give, give you sort of uh, have a lot of promise for the future that, that you're excited about? And how do you believe these, can, the, these solutions can impact your teams? Mike, we can start with you, then, then Derek, uh, you, you can take us home. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Um, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of what Derek said, which is don't let any good crisis go to waste. I, I think our team's actually thriving um, right now because we have more uh, opportunity to move things forward that we otherwise wouldn't have had the opportunity to move forward because our organization is more open-minded about almost every single idea, right? Um, but before I get to that, I, I just want to say, the thing that has been best for me is the challenge that this has posed to me as a leader. Um, it, it is the past two or three years have really challenged me as a leader. It's been really tough. It, more and more, it's up to the employer and your, you being the leader of other professionals to be a lot more for them and to them than, you know, be, than an employer was 20, 30 years ago, right? So it's really challenged me and it makes me excited about the team that we've built and what we're capable of doing. So I wanted to start with that, um, you know, kind of back to some of the, the don't let a good crisis go to waste. I feel like it's really kind of jolted us out of um, the healthcare supply chain being stuck in the 20th century. And, you know, a couple of things that I would highlight is, is how that manifests is first of all, remote work is perfectly acceptable for roles that that's okay for. So for example, I'm now looking for sourcing professionals when we have either promotion or turnover across state lines. That, that's been really a benefit for us. So now our pool of candidates is way larger than us being limited to you know, Central Ohio or Derek being limited to uh, Central Indiana, right? Um, it's forced, uh, we talked a little bit about it already, but the second thing I would say that has manifested very positive is it has forced visibility across the supply continuum. So now instead of just, hey, you know, the trains are always going to run on time and we're used to that and we take that for granted, now we have visibility to gap so far up the, the supply continuum that, that we can think differently about those things. Cardinals really helped us in that regard. I think that's a good that has come out of, of the whole crisis. Um, I, I alluded to this already, but the pressure to innovate and the, the lessened resistance to change is evident. Um, you know, we, we are, are really not having much limitation other than capacity on our ability to reduce unnecessary product variation and practice variation. Um, we're consolidating things. Our, our adoption rate of technology is as fast as we can swallow it if we have the capacity. And that hasn't been the case in the past. Um, and then lastly, um, it, it has really forced new conversations between supply chain proper and our clinicians. I've been really positively impressed with our clinicians open-mindedness to new things, different ways, different product, yet allowing them to innovate where they want to innovate. 
right? So I'd say those are the goods that have, have come out of it from my perspective. Thank you, Mike. And uh, Derek, we'll throw it to you and then we'll, we'll take a couple audience questions. Right. So love it, Mike, hit on all the good points. Uh, for us, we, we landed on three things, um, our people, <clears throat> you know, so, um, you know, our building career ladders, something that we probably never really done for them in supply chain. And, and now we're going to focus on that. Um, we did value-based interview training so we can start hiring teammates right up front versus trying to deal with things in, on the back end. Uh, develop, you know, real engagement with our team so that, that they know their value team members in supply chain and they're not forgetting. And we're only not talking about clinicians because supply chain is a value profession. And, and I think through the crisis that showed. And so we're putting a lot of, you know, emphasis on training our team members and making sure they're paid appropriately. Um, and as Mike said, there are some positions within supply chain that can work remote. Um, so how, how and where they work is important to that discussion as well. Um, for us, another thing we're looking at as part of building out that ecosystem evaluation is we built a five-year strategy that's aligned and supported by our senior leadership. That's something that was not governed before. Um, so they sit on, our, on a governance panel for us as well to help guide us through what the next three to five years look like. Um, and so we want to take the lessons learned from uh, COVID and a lot of product disruptions and not overreact, but don't underreact either. So, you know, you don't want to have to build um, a glove manufacturing shop here in Indiana. So we don't want to go that far, right? We do want to leverage some of the lessons learned and find a balance um, in, in how we deal with our supplier relations. So we're looking at building that foundational work first um, and then optimize, how we want to optimize supply chain in the future and then eventually how we want to transform it. Um, so we're definitely want to look at the, the deep dive into that. And then as Mike said, our partnership with our clinicians, the conversations have changed. Um, and it's for good reason. We have data now to have open discussions with them. Uh, we have agreements with our, our clinicians that they don't want to be in our space and we don't want them there. <laughs> and so uh, we want to have those critical conversations. So supply chain, who are the experts, and we're putting the investment into our people to make them the experts uh, to do supply chain functions. Thank you so much, Derek. Perfect place for us to wrap up this, this, this panel conversation. Mike, Derek, it was a pleasure moderating this. Let's, let's jump in now and, and take a couple audience questions before we sign off. And as a reminder to folks out there, you can enter those audience questions into the Q&A box you see on your screen. Um, and any questions we don't get to, someone will follow up after, after our event here and, and, and get you the info you need. So the first question we'll grab here, the, the attendee asks, um, focusing forward, what are your top three priorities or focus area areas for the rest of 2023 and how are you addressing them? I.e. Optimi optimizing your workflow, reducing waste, managing shipping costs and logistics, product availability, building teams, inspiring your teams. I think all stuff that we definitely touched on in our conversation, but let's let, let's go a little deeper here. Derek, you wanna you wanna take this one? Yeah, yeah. So our, our top three starts with our people. Uh, we're invested in training, um, investing, giving them the data and the, and the analytics they need to make good decisions um, uh, in supply chain. So that's that's our top priority here at IE Health is, is our people. Um, next is the technology. We're looking and, and squire, you know, discarding the whole U.S. Um, for technology. Like I said, ESLs, um, advanced, you know, uh, the labels. Uh, we're looking at you know, point of use inside the locations. What all the data that we can find to make best decisions in supply chain. Um, and lastly is our relationship with our suppliers. Uh, we are taking the top 20 large suppliers and we're digging deep into what their offers, uh, offers that they currently have. And then looking into their resiliency program to see what are you working on three to five years from now to make sure it's in line with our three to five year strategy as well. Thank you, Derek. Mike, what are your top three? Uh, a lot of similarities. I'm starting with culture as well and talent like Derek did. Um, that's what it's all about. And if we can't have the talent we need and generate a culture of engagement and excitement, enthusiasm, the rest just can't happen. And so, um, so that's number one uh, for me and for the organization, frankly, uh, pervasively. I'd say number two is sustainable cost reduction. So not have it just be an event, but how do we build our structure and process around it being sustainable and ongoing? And how does product variation reduction 
constantly become the way we think and do things together, both as supply chain and clinicians going forward. Um, so, so that's what I call number two. And then number three may or may not surprise you, but ESG progress. Um, we, we're, we've made great progress in our equitable spend at Ohio Health. Um, it wasn't without a lot of change management, a lot of focus, a lot of attention. We got to further that, but we also have to do things like, you know, how do we minimize waste? How do we, uh, um, by using reprocessed instrumentation as opposed to disposables, um, how do we get into the business of caring for our community in different ways? Um, so there, there's a couple enablers I view as, as those, as I think about those three priorities. The first one is technology. Derek and I have been broken records about technology. Like Derek and his team, we're on the, you know, we're on the hunt for, for what we need to meet, meet the need. Um, it, it's, it's just necessary to make sure we grow without uh, proportionately growing our headcount. Um, the, the other one on the cultural side is there was something Gartner had talked about um, their, uh, one of their publications talked about what is called the new human deal. Um, and the new human deal covered, you know, what are, what's the new employee value proposition um, when you're thinking about having great talents and having them being real excited and engaged about being where they are and the opportunity for, for progression. That has things in it like, you know, deeper connections is what they want. Flexibility, personal growth. Um, avenues for collaboration around well-being in general, right, and, and shared purpose. So um, that's really resonated as an enabler uh, for us in how we intend to move forward. Other enablers are, you know, continued and deepening engagement with our clinical enterprise. That's going to continue to be more vital. And then lastly, we... Um, we actually signed the Health and Human Services Climate Pledge um, back in October that, that Mo saw in the media. And that's, that's putting pressure on our need to make progress in that space. So uh, really excited about that. Um, I'm thinking, you know, Derek and I's teams hopefully are the benefactor of other manufacturers and producers upstream making progress in that space. Thank you, Mike and Derek, for, for both tackling that one and, and, and sharing those priorities. We've got time for, for maybe one more question here. Um, so I'll, I'll give it to you and then, then you can both take uh, maybe 30, 60 seconds or so to, to answer this one so we can sign off. Um, what professional development and learning tools do you find most helpful to keep up with trends? This seems like a good one to close on. Uh, Derek, go ahead. Well, <clears throat> ARM, um, we are ARM members, and so ARM is like our source of truth as a supply chain professional in healthcare, so we love to, to read ARM. We also use work with the Warehouse Education Research Council because we have a distribution uh, center model here, uh, and we're also looking outside of healthcare. Uh, part of our uh, people first engagement was, you know, in operations was reading the Run, Improve, Grow. Uh, book for our leadership team so that we can start to manage the run versus stay in the run all day and then improve and grow where we can grow and start doing grow and improvement work uh, to be a better partner with our clinicians. Thank you, Derek. Hey, Mike. Yeah, I would just add uh, that ARM is a big deal for us as well. A real, real nice platform there for continued development. I'd also throw Gartner in that. Um, in that space, their offering is, is pretty pervasive. On supply chain as a global function and not, not always just in healthcare, but a global function. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Derek, once again. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was a pleasure coming on and facilitating this conversation. Um, really, really wonderful talk. Uh, so Derek and Mike, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all the attendees. And of course, I also wanna thank Cardinal Health for, for helping us put this on, sponsoring today's webinar. To learn more about the content presented today, you can check out the resources section on your webinar console and do fill out the post-webinar survey. Thank you for joining us. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you.